was uh, saying earlier, it's quite an irony that you were actually working in your vacation from university at the famous Blair's Lasky studio in 1916. That must have been very shortly after Goldwyn left, was it? I believe it was just after he left. Mr. Lasky was head of the studio then. And Golden had gone off and formed his own Golden Company. So you didn't meet him then? No, I didn't meet him till a good, quite a bit later. Did you hear anything about his reputation when you worked there? No, I don't think so. But uh, I heard that he was an individualist and he'd gone off because he disagreed. And I think primarily he wanted to go off somewhere where he could boss things, you know, where he could run things in his own way. That, you think that was his distinguishing characteristic, really? That he wanted to be a boss? Oh, I think that Golden always wanted to be a boss. He wanted to put his own stamp on a picture, and uh, he had uh, his own ideas about making a picture. For instance, he thought that the writer was the primary cause of making our I think he said that the writer was the important factor in making a picture he thought that the director was there purely to interpret a writer that was his, his own ideas and he got the best writers he could get and he tried to make the best possible pictures in his estimation that you can make but I don't think he was a particularly good man to work with a director. Because always the writer superseded. And in my own case, I probably had a great deal to do with the writing of almost every picture I made. And I didn't always enter, uh, agree with Goldwyn. We worked on one story called Barbary Coast. That was your first picture for him, was it? I believe it was the first one. He wanted a story about the Barbary Coast, and he couldn't get it, and so... I went east and worked with Ben Hecht and Charlie MacArthur, and we worked hard on it, and we had a pretty good story. And then we came back in Golden and didn't like the story. I told somebody that by the time we finished... Uh, doing the picture, that Miriam Hopkins came into the Barbary Coast like a confused and bewildered Golden Girl. And we lost all, many of our good scenes because I think our picture was a little too hard hitting. We knew what the Barbary Coast was at that time and we were trying to do something that was rather real. The Barbary Coast is the coast around San Francisco, is that right? little south of San Francisco. In the early days of the gold rush in San Francisco. Yeah. When it was a pretty tough, rough place. The picture was not. What scenes did you have in there that Goldwyn wanted out? About a third of them. He just didn't like them when we set to work again and changed them. and ended up in my opinion, a very denatured sort of a thing. So that I really didn't enjoy the picture. A few of the things I thought were good, but uh, it lost its reality. Did he make it clear why he objected to the scenes? Not always. Golden wasn't extremely lucid about those things, about explaining them. He just didn't like them, you know. You couldn't really tell why he didn't. It, it would come out. You'd finally learn, and uh, but it was rather tough to follow him. What he really was trying to do was probably trying to make a more of a family picture out of it. And, and in my opinion, he shouldn't have tried to make the Barbary Coast in a family picture. He felt that a lot of the scenes were too explicit sexually, were they? He wanted a little bit more of a poet meeting a 
a girl such as Miriam Hopkins played and, and doing it in a romantic way. And it was hard for the writers, for Hector MacArthur and for me to coordinate that kind of a thing. We rather didn't believe in it. So it wasn't too happy an experience. But you had to actually bow down to I mean, you had to. Oh, do yes, what said. sure. I made another picture for him called Ball of Fire, which there was absolutely no interference. He liked everything about it. And it was a, we had a very happy time making it. Quite different than the previous picture. Do you think perhaps he liked Ball of Fire because it was about slang? Oh, I don't think so. Actually, uh, he bought the original story, and Bracken and Wilder told me the story, and I liked it, and I said I'd do it, and I went fishing in Florida for six weeks and came back, and they'd made no progress. And I said, what's the matter? And they said, oh, well, we're not sure, but we don't seem to know what this story's about. And I said, well, it's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And they looked at one another and said, well, it'll be done in about two or three weeks. And we had no trouble with it. I thought perhaps it might have been appealing to Goldwyn because of the use of uh, American slang expressions in it, which was quite a part of the plot, which he might have found rather amusing because of his own interest in... Well, writing. it was rather an erudite comedy, and... Uh, that could have appealed to Goldwyn a good deal because it was a writer's comedy. And uh, it was all a little bit unreal and uh, really laid a good background for that type of comedy and it appealed to Goldwyn. It was, a, it was good from his standpoint. Consequently, there was no interference and uh, I enjoyed making the picture. Although he liked writers and he thought they were very important, how highly do you actually rate his judgment of writing as such? I can't give him any A pluses for that at all. I think he had uh, a great taste in picking writers and then he depended on the writers. Bob Sherwood, for instance. Lillian Hellman, people like that. It so happened that Golden was inclined to classify writers as a whole, not as one superb individual and one hack. When I worked on a picture with him, Bracken and Wilder were probably two of the finest writing teams for pictures. Hecton MacArthur. Where we got into trouble again was in uh, taking a very bad story by Edna Ferber called Come and Get It. Golden was going to the hospital and he asked me to do it. And he said, you're me in charge and just go ahead and make it. I talked to Miss Ferber and I said, you, this isn't a very good story that you've written here. She said, what's the matter with it? And I told her some things, and she said, how do you know? And I said, well, my grandfather was Charlie Howard, and I know that he was one of the characters in your book. And he said, she said, my Lord, you know more about it than I do. And I said, yeah, I do. So we started to work on the thing, and I changed it all around. I didn't, why kept the basis of her story and everything, but changed many characters all around. When Mr. Golden came back and saw it, I told Mrs. Golden, I said, I don't think you ought to let him see it. I'm going to be through in a week, and he's still a weak man. He's an operator. On. She said, I can't stop him. Well, I said, he's liable to faint. He almost did. So I had a conversation with him, and I said, Now, look, Sam, you're a sick man. Isn't there somebody that you can 
your organization that you can have talk to me and get all the things that should be tell me all those things and see that we do what you want done to this story because actually the things you wanted it could be six of one and half a dozen of another it didn't make any difference he said that's a good idea so about four or five days went by and turned in some scenes and he said this is exactly what I wanted who wrote them I said I did and he said directors shouldn't write and I said you're stupid and walked out of him and I wouldn't come back again so that didn't then he fooled around with a, another director and they eventually wound up by shooting my scenes William Wyler yeah but you so didn't that, there was just a point and Golden had his own uh, thought. He was just as right as I was. He didn't think a director should write. I thought a director should write. Consequently, we clashed. But you therefore stopped shooting on the picture, and Wyler finished shooting it? But he shot your I scenes. think he did about five or 600 feet in the picture out of 10,000, 10 or 12,000. Do you think when Goldwyn admired writers, uh, as he said, the best writers, like Sherwood or Lillian Hellman, was he using his own judgment or just the fact that other people spoke well of them? Well, I think he was smart. I think he used uh, other people's, the majority. They were recognized as being good writers. One of the first things he, he did was... He made a series, Famous Authors. It was, it was successful. In about 1918. And it worked. And oddly enough, I went into Paramount after he'd left, and Mr. Lasky hired me and asked me if I could get together 40 pictures for them in a very limited time. And I said, easy, you give me the money. He said, you can have all you want. I bought two Rex Beaches, two Zane Grays, two Joseph Conrads. And I just went through the list. Nobody bought stories like that. So actually, Goldwyn knew that that 40 pictures were done that way, and he decided, and I think that his came later than that, than that time. It was really the growth of the beginning of getting good writing and good, and good stories. Because pictures before that time had been written by scenario writers, trained in motion pictures, not in dialogue necessarily or anything like that. But you see, Lillian Hellman was a great storyteller and a dialogue writer. She could handle situations. Bob Sherwood was good. I thoroughly admired the fact that he wanted good writers. But it didn't work as far as I'm concerned, and with a number of directors it didn't work. Did he admire uh, Brackett and Wilder? Yes, because they had a, a very fine reputation for doing comedies. Even in the early 30s? Mm-hmm. And he gave them their head? Except on, as you say, except on... Well, the only time that he, Barbary Coast. That he, Barbary Coast was he went against it. Of course, Hecht and MacArthur were an entirely different type of writers. Oh, yes. But he didn't, therefore, he didn't admire Hecht and MacArthur as, as he admired Brackett and Wilder. Yes, his, his relation with uh, Hecht and MacArthur continued. I don't know uh, whether it made any dent in him at all, the fact that, that we didn't like what the changes that we did. He was a very determined man. He wanted his own way. If 
he thought a thing, he was going to get it. You told me uh, um, earlier that when you were making Barbary Coast, uh, you decided that you would make things up. You, uh, on the spur of the moment, during the day, in fact, you extended the part of Walter Brennan, I think. Is that right? Yes. And what sort of control did he exercise over that? None, I suppose. Oh, none. If he saw the stuff, if I changed and, and added to something and he saw it, if he liked it, he, he thought that was fine. But otherwise, you had to cut it out. Yes, he would find out pretty well what you were doing. He had people that were kind of watching and probably relayed to him. And, and uh, What I really was talking about is the story the, of the characters. Once you get a character started, you have to go on with the character that way. You can't change it. Once you give Miriam Hopkins a lot of romantic notions about coming to a new country and all of that, you can't very well go back to the real reason for why a woman in those days came out to that country. Which was for what? Gold. We were allowed finally, I think, in the picture to say that it came out here for gold because we convinced him that but by that time he thought that she wouldn't be blamed too much for saying that. Can you think of any specific incidents in the film, as it is now, that you regret having had to put in? I can't remember that much. I just remember that the tenor of the story was changed, that the whole thing was devitalized. I think I told you earlier that I described Miriam Hopkins coming into Barbara Coast as a confused and bewildered Goldwyn girl. And that would say what I thought of the character we were portraying. Did you ever have to use the Goldwyn girls in anything you did for Goldwyn? Never. Was there any suggestion that you should? No, never. No, that was something. I don't think that he uh, thought that I knew how to make a musical. We made another picture. The song is born. It was really a remake a ball of fire, which I did with Cooper and Barbara Sandwick. This was to be done with Danny Kaye. Golden came to me and said, I can't get a story for Danny Kaye. I said, you get a great one. Do ball of fire. Instead of uh, about writing a dictionary, make it a bunch of people uh, writing about music and then it fit Danny Kaye beautifully oh he said that's a great idea about three weeks went by and he called me up and he said Art we've got a really great idea we're going to lay it in 1922 I said that's a great idea that somebody goes out looking for new music and comes back with Dixieland are you nuts Oh, he said, I guess that won't work. And I said, no, it won't work. So about a month later, he called me up and he said, you do it. And I said, Sam, I don't believe in redoing any picture. I don't mind doing redoing something that somebody else did, but I don't want to redo my own, and especially not in this kind of thing. But he kept after me and after me and after me until finally, I think, just, to, I said, okay, I'll do it. And then he wouldn't let me do it. He wouldn't let me make the changes. He got a writer that I didn't agree with. And I would get certain plans to do certain things, and they'd send down word that they had plans that we do. So I never... I didn't go to the rushes. I never saw the picture cut. I don't feel as though I had anything to do with it. Have you seen it now? No. To this day? No, I haven't seen it. It was made in 1948. Well, that's a long time. But as long as I've gone this far, I'm going to keep on going. <laughs> well, it's not as good as Ball of Fire. 
Uh, I think that's uh, true to say. But you must have, although he was obstinate and stubborn, now you must have admired him to some extent to work with him uh, for occasions. I admired him for what he stood for. He wanted to make good pictures. And that in this business is a very admirable trait. The desire to make really good pictures. And he didn't let anything cost-wise or anything stand in his way. He hired the best people, the best writers he could get a hold of. If he had a fault, it was that he didn't allow them always to go ahead. Maybe it was due to some bad advice. He had some people working for him that I didn't think were capable people. Anyway, when those things came around, he insisted upon his way. And in those things, he and I tangled. So it's just as simple as that. Was that his own virtue, you think? The desire to make great pictures and the desire to get the best people? Or did he actually get the best people? He didn't get the best directors. He got one very good director, William Wyler. But uh, a lot of the really good directors steered away from him because of they knew of his thoughts about directors. There are some directors that aren't any good unless they're allowed to tell stories themselves. A director is merely a storyteller. If he can't tell it his way, then he doesn't know what the deuce to do about it. And uh, I worked with many people, Salberg, Harry Cohen, Jack Warner. We just did what we thought was the best. And I talked with Frank Capra the other day. We talked about Harry Cohen. People have said things about him that we both decided we thought he was just great. He let us alone. We made movies the way we thought they should be made. And actually, we don't know how to tell a story somebody else's way. We only know how to tell it our way. But when you take a really good writer, like Hemingway, I tried to get him, we, we were very good friends, and I tried to get him to write for me. He said, no, I don't want to have any part of Hollywood. And I said, you don't have to come to Hollywood. We can meet, go fishing, hunting, the way we do now. I said, Ernest, I can make a picture out of your worst story. He said, what's my worst story? And I said, oh, that bunch of junk called to have and to have not. Oh, well, he said, I just need the money. And I said, well, I don't care. It's pretty, pretty bad. He said, you can't make a picture out of that. So we sat around for three weeks trying to figure out how to make a picture of it. And I went back, bought it, made it. It's a very, very successful picture. So I think no matter what a good writer writes, that somebody, but it doesn't mean that everybody can take a hold of a story and do it. You said you admired Harry Cohn because he let you get on with it. Is that right? Yes. Have you ever had the experience of a creative producer who actually was useful in giving advice, but staying out of the way when necessary? No, not that I can remember. Oh, I have had instances of uh, where they bought the story and saw a good picture in there. Jesse Lasky gave me my first job. He bought Sergeant York. I made it because he gave me my first job. Cooper made it because Lasky gave him his first job. I told Cooper, I said, I don't think we can do any harm but to ourselves by making it. Well, Cooper says, what's the use in arguing about it? We're going to do it, aren't we? And I said, yeah. But I said, you come on over with me while we talk to Warner. If I say, isn't that right, Mr. Cooper, you say, yep. And so I said, we'll make this picture if you let us alone. Isn't that right, Mr. Cooper? He said, yep. And if you don't let us alone, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Isn't that right, Mr. Cooper? He said, yes. So we made 
And Lasky, who was broke at the time, made a couple of million dollars, and Cooper got an Academy Award, and I felt very good about it, so we had a great time. Was, to go back to uh, Sam Goldwyn, did, was he a genuine star maker in the sense that he picked the right people himself, or was it up to his directors to make them for him? That's difficult to answer. He had an innate sense of picking somebody, like Merle Oberon he picked. I remember when she started. Uh, Ronald Coleman he picked. Of course, Ronnie uh, was an experienced actor when Golden took him under his wing. Where did he spot Merle Oberon? Can you remember? As I remember... Merle had a very rather oriental look. She dressed in black. Almost a uh, siren quality. He asked me one time what I would do and I said I'd put her in a tweed skirt and a shirt waist and have her wear some good tailored clothes and let that odd quality show through rather than trying to make it up, you know, make it up. He made some tests and he was tickled to death and he, and he went on with her and she did a very good job for him. Did he come down on the set with you and uh, attend to the dress and the appearance of people in your pictures? No. He boasted of doing that, didn't he? Yes. Mm -hmm. But is that because you wouldn't let him or discouraged him? Well, I couldn't very well uh, say that he couldn't come down, but I discouraged him by telling him I couldn't work very well with him around there. Why doesn't he go? So he'd go. Not always he wouldn't go. But I mean... Uh, if the picture was going good things went well with Goldwyn. If the picture was not going well, things did not go well with Goldwyn. Is it fair to say that he was largely mistrusted or disliked by other people in Hollywood? I don't think so. I don't think he was distrusted. I don't think he was disliked. I think that they... Uh, not everybody took him seriously because of the numerous faults that he had about his, his uh, thing that is called Goldwynisms, you know, and the things that he did. Mr. Goldwyn had very definite ideas, and he liked you to follow the script. I remember one picture where we didn't follow the script at all. It was Barbary Coast. I had a chance to put some comedy in that, so that was the only chance that I had to change things. So I needed an actor, and I had a very smart man, an uh, assistant director, who said, you know the character you told me about the other day? And I said, yeah. And he said, I know it man who's just exactly what you talked about. But he said he's just an extra man. But I wish you'd see him. And I said, okay, but get him in costume, give him a few lines, and save me having to see him two or three times. He said, all right. And he brought in Walter Brennan. I started to laugh, and I looked at Brennan. And I said, Mr. Brennan, did they give you some lines to read? And he said, yes. And I said, do you want to read them with me? Certainly, he said. With or without? And I said, with or without what? And he said, teeth. <laughs> that made me laugh. And so I said, without teeth. And he turned around and he took the teeth out and he started to read. And he was only supposed to work three days. I think I kept him three weeks. And I think he got nominated for an Academy Award. Now, Goldwyn saw that and he liked it. So you could do things like that, but you couldn't change the story on him. You see, that wasn't changing the story. That was just making extra scenes. But did he have a sense of humor? 
could you rely on things? No, no, fun? no, I don't think so. At least he didn't have my sense of humor. I didn't think... I think some of the things that he... Malaprop things that he said were funny, you know, though I don't think that... Uh, I don't think that they were... You know, he would be by no means be called a comedian. Did, did he ever make any of his famous malapropisms, his goldenisms, to you? He introduced me to a very good-looking girl, a writer, and said, I want you two to cohabit very closely. <laughs> <laughs> and did you? Oh, no, we worked on the story. <laughs> but those were... You're convinced that those were unintentional. He didn't create them. No, he didn't do it. He didn't try to do them. I think he enjoyed the reputation he got. I think he liked the uh, personal publicity that he got. I think he liked the character. I think he was a great showman, and they would like anything like that. Was he more admired than not in Hollywood? Oh, he was admired for his, for what he wanted to make when he started a picture. There were a few people that didn't like Goldwyn. But almost everybody admired him. Not all the people wanted to work for him. Because too many stories got around about the difficulty in working with him. I'd have to say that he was admired for his desire to make good pictures. For his desire to make good pictures. And he certainly succeeded to a large extent. He made very few bad ones. What sort of impact do you think he had on Hollywood and its working methods? I think that he strengthened the desire of Hollywood to hire better writers, to hire good writers, to buy better books and to try and make pictures that were out of the ordinary because he made some that were completely out of the ordinary and they were very successful. I also think that the fact that his pictures were successful, they were almost invariably a family type of picture. Anybody could go and look at them. The more I look back on it, the more I admire him when I see the junk that's being made today. Do you admire anything that you see in the cinema nowadays? Yes, a number of things. I think the two best young directors are Bogdanovich, Peter Bogdanovich, and Bill Friedkin. But in the last Academy Awards, I liked The Sting. I bet on The Sting. People said didn't have a chance. Afterwards, they wondered why they gave me four and five to one against the sting. And I said, because it's the only good comedy that's been made in two years. Because those two fellows are great together. Because the direction was good. And it was a funny picture. And I said, I thought it was going to win because it, it, it entertained people. I don't think a lot of these pictures are entertaining I think The Exorcist frightens people, and you know, but I think The Sting was really good entertainment, and I was tickled to death to see it win. How do you think Goldwyn would have reacted to what is going on in the current cinema? I think he'd been thoroughly against it. I think everything he tried to make, he tried to make for a general audience. I don't think he wanted to offend anybody. I think that's... Probably the reason I had trouble with him on one picture, Barbary Coast. And I think that is why they are advertising his pictures today as fit for an entire family to see. I think he worked hard to get that, to do that. I think he would have thrown a fit if he'd seen some of the pictures today and said so in no uncertain terms. The last picture you made with him was in 1948. Did you have any plans to make uh, more after that, or did you see him much after that time? 
What picture was that? I can't, I've forgotten. That was A Song is Born, the remake of Ball of Fire. No, after the, after the last picture, I never, I realized that we couldn't work well together. We remained friendly. I used to go and play croquet with him, drop in at his house occasionally. He was a great uh, croquet fan, wasn't he? Yes, he just loved it. Was he any good at it? I wouldn't say he ranked with the best, but he played very earnestly and very seriously, and he enjoyed playing. He generally tried to make up a match so that it would even up pretty well. He'd want the best person to play with him. But he kept up this beautiful court and, and uh, invited people to play every weekend. He was, was he an athletic man? I think the only athletic college, I think he played many years ago a few games of golf. Not as a good golfer. But I used to go to the studio and pass him daily. And he would walk four or five miles to the studio. From his home? From his home, with his head up, swinging his arms, and arriving. And he, he was in really good shape for a man of his age. A apart from his croquet interests, did he have any other kind of life outside the cinema? I don't think so, no. I don't believe that he ever went as a, a looker on, as a watcher of sport. And I think his entertaining was done with people that he wanted to have contact with, writers, actors, various people. I think he lived wholly for the picture business. It was quite an accident, wasn't it, that he fell into it in a way. I mean, he was, he ran away from Poland, he was an orphaned boy, he was making gloves, he was a salesman, and suddenly this thing clicked, the cinema, and he never looked back. Can you imagine any other life for him had he not had the cinema? Well, that'd be hard to do because there were many like him. Uh, Zukor and... Lasky, and Lasky was a cornetist in a band, you know, and they just got in in the beginning. Maybe they had a uh, little theater, a Nickelodeon or something like that, and they just gradually fell into it. The mill, famous players Lasky uh, and Goldwyn came out and established picture making because they, they worked under the sun out here, not lights. They worked with open air stages. And they didn't have cameramen adjusting the lights and doing everything, and they they just made scenes when they could. And usually, one partner stayed in New York and sold the pictures, and the other partner stayed out here and made them. I would say Golden occupied both positions. He sold and made them. But one of the Warner brothers stayed in New York and the other stayed out here. One of the Cones stayed in New York and the other made the pictures out here. It led to some very strange things that were to boost the ego of the one who stayed in New York. They upped the uh, price of distribution of pictures to an enormous amount or just to keep things kind of even. I don't understand. How do you mean that? Well, the brother in New York will, say, charge 35% for distribution when it could probably have been done for 15%. Goldwyn realized that, and after he started making good pictures, he wouldn't pay them more than 15%. Neither would Disney. But they were still trying to get 35% in the picture business. And that's why Golden determined to become an independent. And yes, to become an independent. What was it like? Can you talk a little bit about Hollywood in the very early days when you were out here? 
Well, that covers a lot of uh, space. At famous players, Lasky, for example. Well, you... I went to work there as a property man. My principal work at the beginning was moving furniture onto the set and off the set. One day they needed a modern setting, and I'd had four or five years of architecture, so I said, I can do it. It was for Doug Fairbanks, and Doug and I became friends. He was courting Mary, so Mary Pickford, so he said, uh, why don't you use Howard as your property man? So Mary said, okay. And then I did some things that she liked, so she said, do you want to be my assistant director? And I said, yes, I would. And then the director got drunk one day, and she said, I guess we can't work. And I said, why don't we make some scenes? And she said, can you do it? And I said, yes. So I became a director. Well, you couldn't do that today. You said once, it's a pity today the young directors don't have nearly as much freedom as we had in the old days. Is that true? No, they can't have. The uh, directors in television are so bound up by time. They have to do a certain number of scenes a day, and they're inclined to be bad scenes for that reason. They're not judged by how good scenes they make but how quickly they do them and stay within the budget. If you ask any of the good directors in motion pictures, they t they'll tell you that they really didn't pay much attention to the budget. They were out there to make a good picture. Of course, sometimes they, they did. And within reason, if somebody came and suggested something to them to save money, they'd, they'd do it. But today, when I start directing, uh, you can make a good picture for thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars. The second one I made got its money back from one theater. And uh, today you can't back up to a start for less than two hundred thousand, and that's the cheapest thing that you can do it with. I'd hate to try for anything under a couple of million. So it's quite a little difference. I suppose one of the virtues of Goldwyn was that he put quality first and he didn't mind about how much it cost or how long it took. No, he knew that if he made a good picture, he'd get it back and get more. And he did, all through his existence. When was the first time you came across him? I can't remember. I remember one time when he met his wife, whom I'm very fond of, and we went out somewhere and came back, and he wanted to come to his house and have a drink before going home, and he leaned into a big fireplace to light the light, and he hit his head and practically knocked himself out coming out of the fireplace. I thought that's a fine way to begin with the courting, and, but it worked out beautifully. Mrs. Francis Goldwyn, that is, how much influence do you think she had on his decisions? A great deal of influence. He relied on her advice, and it was good advice. He relied on her opinions. And she took a great many things off his shoulders that he had bothered with before. Oh, costuming and different things and the running of the studio that left him free to, to go ahead and make pictures. Was there a suggestion that her taste was rather better than his in the matter of costuming and hairdressing? I would say so, yes. Because she was a very smart woman and had good taste. I think he recognized it. I don't think it ever can be a question of who's better. I think that he was very happy with what she did and, and it relieved him from things. Something that he probably didn't know too much about. This is rather a strange and uh, unusual thing, isn't it? There can't be many examples in Hollywood's history of a producer being advised and helped by his wife like that over a period of 50 years, practically. There are very few. Very few. So that you could say, in a sense, that Goldwyn Pictures was Mr. and Mrs. Goldwyn Pictures to a certain extent. To a certain extent, you'd say that the Goldwyn Pictures were done by Mr. and Mrs. Goldwyn. 
And I don't think of any other couple that worked that way. Do you think, one last question, do you think he was better at picking male stars or female stars? Well, right now, I think that the male stars, Merle Oberon was a female star that he chose, who did very, very well. He chose a number of girls who were really good actresses, but they didn't become big stars. I never agreed with him on the choice of uh, a girl that he used in musicals. I've forgotten her name now. But I think that he, he did have a very good taste, Frederick March, and Best Years of Our Life, and Oh, a number of people that he did, he really was good at. What about the notorious uh, failure he made with Anna Sten? Well, I think it was a mistake. Everybody's entitled to make some mistakes that way. But I think that he just tried something that didn't work, that's all. See, strange things happen. The camera likes some people. I don't think it liked her. You if like you get that? somebody that the camera likes, they can do no wrong. Gary Cooper could do a scene, you could watch him doing the scene, and you think nothing's happening. You see it the next day in the, in the projection room, and everything was happening. Bogart, do you think he's the choice of a romantic leading man? People are crazy today about him. They want to go and see him. Camera like Marilyn Monroe. She'd sit on a set kind of down and you'd get her out there and you'd say camera and her head would come up like this and all of a sudden she became sexy. In real life, nobody would take her out. There was little or no sex to the girl. But she had a strange oh, thing that made her sexy to millions of people. So that, in order for that to happen, the camera has to like you. It liked Merle Oberon. I don't think it liked uh, the girl that Goldwyn used in so many uh, musicals and everything. She was very beautiful, but I don't think the camera really got under her skin. Do you mean Virginia Mayo? Yes. Yes, I mean the Virginia Mayo. What do you say about Marilyn Monroe? Do you mean literally that nobody would take her out? That she was not uh, dated by anybody? I mean that literally. I used her in the picture. The gentleman for blondes. Because at Palm Springs, nobody would take her home from a cocktail party. And she'd come up to me and say, please, can I get a ride home? And so one time I said to her, if you can't talk, why, can you sing? And she said, yes. And I turned the radio on and she sang. And she sang good. That's why we happened to make gentlemen prefer blondes. Nobody knew that she could sing. No. Or act, even. And she didn't know. I think she ran away about three times from the sound stage when we were recording her songs. But I always had a man at the door to stop her and wouldn't let her out. She's just afraid that she wasn't doing them well enough. She had no confidence whatsoever. Your whole job in making a picture with Monroe was to create a feeling of confidence. She actually didn't want to leave her dressing room to come out on the stage and make, and make a scene. Was she like that, do you think, the whole of her working life? Well, I worked with her pretty much in the beginning. 
I've heard other people say so, but I couldn't swear that she was that way, but I'm quite sure that she was. She had to be bolstered, and then she became something that the camera liked, and she became a great big star. And you think that just to return to Goldwyn, whom we've rather forgotten for a moment, you think he had the ability to see this quality, perhaps, in some people that made him a star picker? Oh, there's no doubt about that. He had good taste about getting people. Everybody makes mistakes, you know, sometimes. His choice of Danny Kaye is that, for that type of comedian was a great choice. Did you find it difficult working with Danny Kaye? I didn't find it easy. I wouldn't say that that's my, my type of humor. Did you enjoy working with Goldwyn? I couldn't truthfully say that I enjoyed working with Mr. Goldwyn. One picture, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But whenever it came to a matter of opinion or something, I'd been used to doing things my own way, and Golden had certainly had his way about everything. So we clashed, and the result wasn't too good. I had great admiration for what he tried to do, which is making good pictures. He really set out, set out to make the best picture that he could. But it also had to be his way. And as long as a director is a storyteller, he can't tell somebody else's story. He has to tell a story the way he's accustomed to telling it. So we had certain troubles.